Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, today. Um, what I would like to do is um, tell you uh, a little bit of a story of what, how, how I think the worlds of television and Twitter are coming together. And um, it's really the story that's unfolding is uh, the most pervasive and powerful global medium that we've ever created, television, um, is beginning to intersect a global social medium. And the two are starting to shape each other. And as they do so, what I think is happening is we're seeing uh, the formation of a kind of hybrid new uh, way for people to interact. And that, of course, is the story of uh, Twitter and TV. And um, the way that, at least sort of my perspective of what's happening, is that Twitter can be seen as a kind of force multiplier uh, for TV. Um, and I mean quite literally uh, this idea of uh, a force multiplier as they'll sort of unpack as we go. Um, what is really um, sort of powerful about this, uh, this dynamic is that it's an audience-driven um, pattern. It's, it would be nice if we at Twitter could say that we sort of anticipated that this would be a major use case of Twitter. Uh, the, the reality is it's really audiences that have been showing all of us the way. And so as people started finding it natural to tweet about TV, uh, we started seeing shifts in, uh, you know, on the TV side, uh, how the, the studios and the networks started adapting uh, their behavior and their content. Um, of course, in the marketing world, we're seeing shifts in practices. And Twitter itself is uh, starting to make a number of changes. And I want to give you a sense of some of those changes on the Twitter side, uh, including some concepts that we're working towards that, that don't exist yet today. Um, the other thing I want to do is just uh, unpack a little bit of the underlying human psychology and dynamics that have really nothing to do with Twitter or TV in particular, but I think are sort of the underlying dynamics that are being tapped into that we're seeing surface uh, at the intersection of Twitter and TV. And so, so starting there on kind of the human element, um, I just want to point out that um, what I think is really unique about television that's shining through in, uh, in sort of the current context is that TV provides a sequence of broadcast events. So it creates a synchronized uh, experience. And as we go through um, this story around television, I'd like you to just kind of keep in the back of your mind that TV is not the only source of synchronized events. In fact, right now, uh, you're all part of a synchronized event because you're all facing me and I'm, I'm uh, sort of the, the mini broadcaster. And life is full of synchronized experiences and anywhere that you find them, the same dynamic, which is having a social medium that can interplay with a synchronized experience, leads to very interesting um, uh, sort of, uh, properties. So if you, for a minute, were to back off from television and, and look for uh, a broadcast event pre-TV, um, I'll, I'll use as my favorite example of the original broadcast event, uh, the sunset. So you have a number of people who are, of course, seeing the same sunset at the same time. And if you now think about the difference between experiencing this sunset alone versus with a companion, let's say with a loved one. And now the difference between seeing it alone versus that companion saying something. So uh, I've got a six and eight year old, my child points out the pretty little cloud above the hills, or my wife comments on the color of the sky. And those words, that social medium, the face-to-face -face interaction, I, I think uh, most of us will share the intuition, can completely transform the primary experience. So how you see the sunset, and perhaps most importantly, how you remember that sunset, and if you remember it at all, all of those basics can be completely altered by the social interaction around the sunset. I, I realize I'm not saying anything new, but uh, that's kind of the point. That this is actually very basic types of dynamics that we're seeing uh, uh, unearthed in a new way with Twitter. So if we take that uh, sunset example, and now we move beyond face-to-face -face social media and think about Twitter. And when I think about Twitter as a medium, I actually think it is literally a new communication medium on par with 
uh, the telephone or the radio. And of course, it's defined in software. It's built on top of the internet. But if you look at it in terms of its properties, I think there are three properties which held together define Twitter in terms of its uh, uniqueness as a new communication medium. Uh, of course, it's public. And I assume everyone here uh, understands that tweets can flow anywhere within the Twitter network, and often they flow out of the network and end up on television. Tweets end up uh, published in the, in the news, and in general, users of Twitter uh, might be uh, surprised that, to see their tweet on TV, but uh, the, the basic um, agreement or sort of understanding with users is never violated because it's understood to be a public medium. Um, number two, Twitter is conversational, so the base form of a tweet are words, so we use it to talk to one another. And third, and this is a little bit uh, of a subtlety here, I, I really like the word live to capture um, the temporal as aspect of Twitter. So it's, we often hear the phrase real time. Uh, Twitter is no doubt a real time platform. That's kind of a technology term. But if you examine how people actually think about Twitter and the kind of communication that people tend to find authentic on Twitter. It's when you're talking about something that's happening in the moment. Um, if you uh, have an experience and at the end of the day you're, think you're recalling it, you might blog about it, but in the moment if you want to share what's happening as it's happening, uh, sort of what's emerged as more or less the, the de facto place to do it is Twitter. And so that's what I mean by live. And we're going to see some data um, to, to kind of uh, uh, back up that definition. So when you put these three together, uh, one way um, that you might think about what is Twitter or what's flowing through the pipes of Twitter uh, is a kind of soundtrack, a, a social soundtrack, a synchronized conversation for life in the moment. So this is an example, a very simple data visualization of starting to tune in to that soundtrack, uh, in fact, for sunsets. So this is the way to read this visualization is along the vertical, we go from noon to midnight, uh, so uh, the, of a day. And along the, um, the other axis, we go from January to December. So it's a whole calendar year. And the depth of the ink is indicating how many tweets per minute uh, contain the word sunset. And this is across four cities. Uh, I guess London probably, given how it's been treating me for the last few days, looks most like Vancouver, so a little cloudier. But in all cases, you see uh, quite literally the, the sun shining through um, the data in Twitter. And uh, tracking the sun, we see bursts of conversation of people uh, talking about expressing themselves as they see the sunset. So why is it that in the moment there's so much Twitter activity uh, talking about the sunset. Well, exactly the same reason if someone was standing next to you and you were taken by the beauty of the sunset, you might turn and make a comment. Exactly the same is happening. Um, and in fact, as we have looked at uh, peered into data in other cities, we see exactly the same pattern um, uh, over and over. So if you take this uh, metaphor of a social soundtrack, I think the place where it almost most naturally fits is with TV. And we just saw some nice examples uh, from recent programs of people tweeting while they're watching. Um, so I, I think that thinking about Twitter as a soundtrack for television, as this synchronized conversation around TV, uh, makes a lot of sense. And uh, it uh, suggests that an audience member might simply tune in and listen to the soundtrack, that you don't have to participate, but of course it's uh, in many ways more engaging if you do. And sometimes, uh, and, you know, Bluefin, uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, was an, a, a social TV analytics uh, company based in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, that I co-founded. And um, we, we started the company around four and a half years ago and spent a lot of time with television executives who um, you know, in the early days felt somehow that, well, Twitter, it seems like it could be um, some combination of uh, whether it's a threat or a distraction, somehow, you know, taking the audience away from TV. And the idea that a soundtrack um, actually does exactly the opposite was sort of where this, this metaphor came from. So similar to uh, the early days of uh, the movie industry, you know, uh, movies were silent. And in fact, for the first two generations, uh, audiences watched movies in silence. And when the, the synchronized soundtrack was invented and introduced, essentially audiences never looked back. 
And far from the soundtrack being a threat to the movie industry, it of course opened up a whole other uh, dimension to the experience and led to a creative explosion. Uh, of new genres and new kinds of movies that simply could not have been imagined before. And I think we're at the earliest stages of a similar transformation of television, where this social soundtrack opens up the creative palette. And I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. It truly is early days, and there is a creative explosion that we're starting to see the beginnings of, where essentially the storyteller can anticipate that this conversation will be there. And how do you transform the content with that uh, anticipated conversation in mind? And you know, putting hashtags uh, as sort of calls to action sort of on top of uh, content is a good early step. But down the road, how will the story itself just naturally uh, bring the conversation um, into the story is sort of the open question. So let me uh, show you some data now. Um, this is taken from uh, uh, a telecast of the X Factor in, in the UK. And what you're going to see here is a, a visualization that's rendered from actual data from this particular telecast. Uh, what we're seeing here is a sample of the, the TV audience shown in white uh, that gathered to um, watch this show. And as uh, we see the opening of this particular uh, episode, one of the audience members named Claire Hardy tweets, Sharon Osbourne is just the best ever. I'm laughing uncontrollably, she tweets. And what I want to do now is trace the kind of life of this tweet. So it's step one in a live medium is that while someone's watching, uh, they express themselves, which happened here. If we now trace what actually happens to that tweet over time, Moments after the tweet is generated, the first of Claire Hardy's followers refreshes their timeline, and that tweet is displayed either on their, their phone or their tablet. And something new at Twitter is that we are now able to actually detect and record when that impression is made. So that is uh, an impression made upon, you might think of it as the Twitter audience that is tuned in to one of the members of the audience of the show. And now if we let uh, time run on over the next roughly hour, uh, a number of followers will uh, receive an impression. And if we look past, the, the show ends where that dark gray ends. Over the next couple of hours, a handful more impressions. So this is from that one tweet that Claire Hardy uh, produced uh, while watching the show. So now let's roll back the clock. And what we can do is look at a 1% sample of the entire audience for this show. And as the show proceeds, we have this um, remarkable effect, which is a virtual tidal wave of impressions being driven as a consequence of the show. And so the reason we're interested in this is that this is actually starting to get quantitative about the social amplification uh, of the show. And we can go and count various things. Left colored in blue here is the subset of the viewing audience that tweeted at least once. We can also look at how many tweets that audience, uh, the, the, the blue audience in total produced. We can count up how many impressions were made and how many unique people saw those impressions. And those four elements, the number of people, how many tweets they generated, the number of people who saw at least one tweet, and the total number of tweets seen, these become inputs for, uh, we heard that Nielsen just uh, came out with a new TV rating in the US. Uh, these four numbers are the, the inputs for that rating. Um, and the Kantar metric will be similarly using these kind of inputs. Um, we can get a little more um, insight into what's happening. If we aggregate all these impressions and just look at their density over time, and again, the gray area is when the show aired, and then a couple of hours after the show aired. Um, you see some interesting things. So these are now impressions per minute. So we see hundreds of thousands of impressions per minute. Um, we have a total of about 18 million impressions over this three-hour window. So you know, uh, uh, obviously a, a, a big reach. And it's interesting just to look at the shape of this curve that, in fact, more 
than half of the impressions of this window are being delivered while the show is on. And so this is something I just wanted to make sure to get across, that not only do people tweet while the event is happening, but a large number of those tweets are received while the show is happening. And in general, uh, this idea that Twitter is a place where people connect um, to talk about things that are happening in the moment um, is a consequence of this sort of general property of the platform that the, the half-life of a tweet is rather short. And so if you're going to see it, you see it soon after it's generated. Otherwise, uh, it's gone. We see that here. So building on this idea of live reach, uh, it's possible to start engineering new capabilities uh, within the Twitter platform, partnering with uh, both the, the television networks and uh, advertisers to create uh, new hybrid forms of communication that start to uh, sort of accelerate the um, the combination of Twitter and TV. So I want to take you through two examples. Um, the first is, it's a concept that I'll, I'll draw out for you. And you, you just heard about TV Amplify. So a large part of, a large fraction of what I will show in this next um, visualization has already been uh, made uh, available in the US and uh, under the TV Amplify program. Uh, I think we're starting to roll some out and I think the the UK team here will correct me if I get details wrong, but uh, of Amplify in, in, the, U, uh, in the UK. And the, the entire uh, concept that I'll take you through uh, will uh, soon be available in the US uh, as depicted. So this is an example uh, using NBA. So we've got the, the, um, uh, the sports program and the audience uh, depicted here as before, but now um, we can draw out the relationship uh, explicitly with the, uh, the television network. In this case, ESPN uh, is, of course, a, a major broadcaster of uh, sports content. ESPN audiences love to tweet. And if we, again, now trace out all of the people who are on the receiving end of these tweets, um, one thing to, to point out is there's no reason that someone who is on the receiving end of a tweet about the basketball game is necessarily watching that game. Right? What they're watching, what they're following, is a person who happens to be watching the game. And so they're, they're getting this, uh, they're, they're kind of overhearing the conversation about the show. So that sets up an interesting opportunity for the television network, for ESPN, to create a second communication path direct to that person. Okay, we, we, can, we might call that impressions-based targeting. And what better thing to put in a targeted tweet in this context than the clip that this person just heard about. And so with the, the cards technology, uh, ESPN can embed um, that little sort of piece of TV, a little break off piece of television. Uh, and of course, this can be done at scale. It can be done live as the television uh, network continues to broadcast. And so you end up with this uh, picture of a new way for the TV network to connect with both its, its audience, but this extended audience on, on Twitter, where the blue is showing the kind of organic social soundtrack that we have without, without trying to do anything new. Um, the red lines uh, create the second pathway, this sort of amplification pathway. And the reason that uh, this is turning out to make a lot of sense for television networks is that the live nature of Twitter means for a television network to extend its live reach, um, it has this uh, uh, sort of audience that is already kind of partially tuned into the content. Little pieces of television flow into the Twitter network. It's a natural invitation to tune into TV, um, uh, letting ESPN build its audience. But if this person doesn't tune in, they're still getting an interesting little piece, a little highlight of what's happening soon after it happens. I didn't show. Uh, in this visualization, but of course, one can imagine a piece of pre-roll, as we saw with the NFL uh, before that uh, piece of video. So it ends up being uh, um, attractive to, to all involved. I'll show you one more example. This is now really focusing on the, uh, the brand marketer perspective, uh, what we call TV ad targeting. And what I'm about to show you here 
has been made generally available in the U.S. Uh, and uh, Oliver showed some uh, early numbers that look very promising, so we're seeing uh, excellent traction. Um, and uh, we do hope to bring the same capability uh, to the U.K. Uh, in the near future. Um, so here, rather than look at one show, we're going to look at the entire television landscape. So each of these uh, nodes depicts a, a show on TV in the U.S. And we have uh, the viewing audience. And this is an example using Glee, a very popular show in the US. So we have the audience of Glee that is live tweeting, and we can see all of their conversation. So we have uh, this, this big audience, um, all connected through a synchronized viewing experience. And meanwhile, we're going to add a third layer to our, our picture, which is the world of brands. And in this example, I'm going to use Volkswagen. So of all the, um, uh, uh, all of the brands, we would take a, a look at Volkswagen. And a capability that uh, we have is to track in real time when an ad is run by Volkswagen. So here is a, a 30 second spot. We link it in real time so we know it aired during an episode of Glee. And then we do the analysis of the conversations on Twitter. We find all the people who are talking about Glee. They're not talking about Volkswagen, okay? They're all talking about Glee, but because we've detected Volkswagen's ad and made a link, we can now make an interesting uh, inference that all those people in blue who are live tweeting about Glee with high likelihood just saw the Volkswagen spot. And so, so here's now an interesting opportunity for Volkswagen to keep the power of the sight, sound, and motion of the, their television spot but complement it with a targeted communication um, pathway through Twitter. And of course, a brand doesn't know usually in real time where its ads will run across all of television, but if we can track each ad and do the links automatically, this entire communication pathway can be automated. And so, this is a, a visual depiction of the TV ad targeting capability. And again, I just want to highlight that from uh, the storytelling and the, the creative canvas this opens up, um, this is, uh, I've shown you a technology picture of what's now possible. But what is the 30 second spot that anticipates this kind of um, uh, sort of multimodal or sort of integrated communication that um, prompts conversation that gets the viewer interested so that when you follow up with perhaps an interactive message through Twitter, uh, you can actually take the attention uh, created by the spot and carry it over into Twitter and actually create some kind of a, um, a, a cohesive message. Um, it's early days. We're seeing some interesting experiments uh, but uh, in the US with this capability, but I think there's a, a really exciting road ahead for creating this kind of uh, integrated communication. Okay, so um, I want to touch on one last topic before I close. So we have seen uh, an example of sort of how the measurement basics work um, in terms of the spread of tweets through impressions, and I gave you two examples of ways in which Twitter is working to start creating these um, coordinated or, or sort of integrated communications. Um, I just want to sort of pop up a level back to um, sort of the, the underlying human dynamics and draw a contrast um, between two ways that you might deliver a piece of video to an audience. Um, just to, to kind of circle back to what matters as we think about measurement and why basics of human psychology are sort of at play in, in, in sort of the questions of measurement. Um, so if you take a piece of video, I'm going to uh, contrast two ways that you can deliver that video to the audience. So in option one, we're going to have, let's say, 100 audience members that see that same piece of video one a day, so staggered over time, uh, versus the same 100 people say, see the same piece of video all at the same time. Okay, so the difference between time shifted versus synchronous viewing. If it turns out that the only thing that's worth measuring to, to understand how much impact that video has had on its audience is reach. If all you need to do is count up how many people saw it, then the impact or sort of the force that that piece of video has in the audience would be identical in these two cases, right? Because the reach is the same. But 
perhaps uh, some of you share my intuition that there is a difference, that somehow, at least in certain contexts, a synchronous uh, delivery can have greater impact, but reach is not actually able to measure it. Okay, so there's something missing when you abstract away time. And so what I want to do is uh, have you brush off a little bit of your uh, high school math. Do you remember this equation? So force equals mass times acceleration. So if I take an object and I throw it, it hits the wall, the force that this object will impact on the wall depends on two things. It depends on the mass, so the bigger, the more mass of the object, the higher the force. But it also depends on the acceleration that is acting upon the object. And so if we take this and kind of stretch this little bit of, uh, you know, this is Newton's second law of motion, um, I want to suggest that the force of any message, including a piece of video, depends on two things. How massive the distribution uh, channel is, um, but also the social acceleration that operates on that message. So two factors, okay? And the way we're gonna get there, do this stretch from physics to media, is to draw on two classic ancient pieces of um, research from psychology. So I'm gonna take you quickly through this, this uh, bit of psychology and then we're gonna bring it all together. So first of all, meet Herman Ebbinghaus. He was the first researcher to look at what happens to our memory as a function of time. And it's actually a kind of depressing story. Um, this is retention. Uh, he had some basic language tasks where he would give you a list of words and then ask you to repeat back what you just saw in the list. Uh, this is the elapsed time since you get to see the thing that you have to replicate. This is how typical human memory looks. 100% recall, so you pick an easy task. Right after you get uh, the list, you have no problem. An hour later, it's half gone. Wait a bit longer, and uh, it, so you know, memory is a very leaky device. And if you don't get uh, to, to the recall task soon after, it's not instant, but within minutes, you just slide off. Okay, so that's the first, and, and this is called uh, in psychology the forgetting curve, quite very well known. Second uh, study comes from 1969. Uh, Milgram, who's quite well known in social network uh, uh, analyses for the six degrees of separation, uh, that was Milgram, uh, did a, a less known piece of work where he showed how attention is steered by the visible crowd. So it, it was a wonderful and simple setup. Um, he went to New York City, Manhattan, placed people on a street corner, varied the size of this planted crowd, and asked them to do a very simple thing, just look up. So he just told them to just look up at the top of a six-story building. And while this planted group was looking up, he would count how many people who were just walking by this busy corner in Manhattan would also look up. And then vary the size of the crowd to see the effect. And here's what he found, or they found. When no one is standing at the street corner, no one looks up. Put one person in the street corner, and the number of people looking up goes to 40%. And what's interesting is, by the time the crowd is five people, you see a cluster of five people, four out of five people walking by will also look up. And this is, uh, just like the forgetting curve, a kind of law-like behavior of how we behave. Where we look is where everyone else is looking. And it saturates very quickly. So a small crowd, if you see them, is enough to steer. Okay, so let's put this all together. And remember, the contrast is, to just understand synchronous versus uh, time-shifted viewing. So in the US, uh, Netflix um, spent uh, an awful lot of money to produce um, a very uh, well-received piece of um, a, a series called House of Cards. And when we now look at the audience, we have the first member of our audience tune in to this time-shifted. Netflix is only available uh, in time-shifted viewing. So we have a person whose memory is, of course, nice and crisp as they watch the program. And a day later, we have a second person view the same program. And as they are on top of the details, of course, the first viewer has forgotten. They have slid down the forgetting curve. And so that becomes a conversation blocker. Um, and whether the person saw it yesterday or hasn't seen it yet at all, so you have uh, this kind of spoiler um, uh, uh, problem blocking conversation. 
you have the same effect, which is, and this is um, the kind of effect you end up with, a lot of people will, in time, see this piece of video, but, and we analyze, we actually look at what's happening on Twitter. There's very little conversation about programs, even very high quality ones, when the audience knows no one else is watching at the same time. So, right? so we, again, we have this intuition, but there's an underlying reason that can't be spanned because of the, the, the memory problem. So now, if we contrast this and say, instead, let's take a piece uh, of drama that has a very different distribution um, uh, property. So we take a piece of broadcast uh, content. Now we have, uh, let's say, for argument's sake, the same size audience, the same mass term. But the thing that is, of course, different is that memory structures are aligned. That's one half of what it takes to get a high social acceleration term uh, at play, right? is that everyone's thinking about the same thing at the same time. The other is to have the right conversational medium. Um, and of course, if you have a public live conversational medium, uh, this audience can now connect with itself. If someone is not tuned in to the program, so they are not looking up at the top of that uh, six-story building, if they are connected to the right people, then while the program is on and inbound tweets come in, it will, in a very law-like way, push them up the attention curve, and they will become more and more likely to tune in. And that is exactly what uh, Nielsen found in their causality study. In fact, I was in Tokyo a couple of weeks ago, and the uh, video research is the official um, uh, ratings uh, system for television in Japan, and they did a study with Twitter and found exactly the same thing. They're seeing uh, causal relationships, so they're seeing people getting pushed up their attention curve. And so when we pull out and get a view of the dynamic around this piece of broadcast programming, uh, the picture is very different. There's not only a large mass term, a lot of people tuned in, but the social acceleration term is high as well. And so the overall impact, um, certainly I would suggest, uh, is uh, significantly greater, right? You have this uh, force multiplier effect because of this acceleration um, that is at play. So if you think about this kind of from what's the value prop? First and foremost for the audience member, well, if I'm seeing a comedian crack a joke on TV and I hear someone else laugh about it, the joke just got funnier and I've just felt a connection with another audience member. Uh, no different than seeing that sunset together versus alone. I see the point scored in a match, and I hear someone react. I hear a crowd react. It connects me both to that audience and to the moment. And so there's this connected experience that makes it better. That's why audiences are ratcheting up their use of Twitter around TV. What is the value proposition for anyone who's on the television side of the divide? Well, if you invested in uh, a comedian to crack a joke, your joke just got funnier, right? And so it's a win-win. It's a if you are creating a piece of drama, you're trying to pr prompt conversation, anything you're trying to do, you know, if, if sunsets were in the business of creating impact, sunsets would want an audience that was connected, right? The primary experience uh, can get, um, in, in profound ways, uh, improved by that audience. And so just uh, to close with a, a kind of fun, visualization as we kind of look at the conversation. Um, it's not just you know, a hand-picked set of shows that we've shown you today where this is happening, but what we're finding is, and, and something that's not actually represented here, is sports, which is the, the single biggest driver uh, of conversation on, um, on, on television. But across, you know, this is like, uh, I guess, uh, reality um, competitions, uh, certainly uh, films when they're, when they're played on television. Uh, current affairs, uh, uh, you know, game shows, even documentaries of certain kinds. So across different genres we're seeing, it's not every show, but sh certain shows can just trigger this kind of conversation and, and tap into uh, the social soundtrack. And so um, uh, ending on my uh, um, kind of play playful last little bit of uh, data visualization, these are, happen to be tweets about TV that we're going to look at, um, resolve uh, a visual puzzle. Um, but the, the sort of 
message here is that for any synchronized experience, TV but beyond, live events, music, breaking news, if you want to connect with an audience in the moment around any kind of a shared experience, uh, there really is one social medium that more and more is showing itself to be sort of the natural fit. And if you want to know what that medium is, all you have to do is look at the data. So with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you.